Hello everybody, Jan Rutherford here with Self-Reliant Leadership. Hope you're doing great. I've got a great guest on the show today and it is Lisa McLeod and I'm having a little bit of technical difficulties. I don't know why my camera is hesitating, but hopefully you can see me, Lisa. Is it working? I can and I'm excited to be here. All right, great. Right as right before we went live, it always happens. There's something, all of a sudden everything sort of froze. And I think it's some glitch with StreamYard a little bit. Um, Welcome to the world of live TV. I have a <laughs> lot of friends that work in the TV business and they're like, yeah, welcome to our life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, it, uh, everything was great. And then all of a sudden it froze. Um, We're oh good my. now. Let's well, jump hey, in. Um, you are the author of this amazing book. Um, let Tell our viewers who you are and how this, how this came to be. So other than being the author of this amazing book, uh, the backstory <laughs> on authoring Selling with Noble Purpose, I've written several books, but this is probably the one I'm best known for. And the backstory is it was the result of a 20 year dual journey on my part. One was uh, as a sales leader, as a sales coach, as a former VP of sales, identifying what differentiated top sales performance. And the second was a very human journey around what makes work meaningful. And as it turns out, the two are the same thing. <laughs> right. You, what's, your, what's your experience actually selling? What's your, what's, what's the backstory there? So my backstory is, um, so I'll tell you something kind of funny. I got hired uh, into sales uh, right out of college. And I went to work, I went to work for Procter & Gamble in sales. And I, after that, went to work for a consulting firm and was the VP of sales and, had, and then I had my own business as I do now for a number of years. But I'll tell you the funny story. When I was graduating from college, I went to a party with my then boyfriend. He later became my husband, but I went to a party with him at his boss's house. And he's a couple of years older than me, so he was already out and working. And if you are graduating from college, if you have a student graduating from college, you know the number one question everyone asks a college senior, so what are you gonna be doing when you graduate? Yeah. So I go to this party and I've just gotten the offer from Procter & Gamble and I'm so excited, I can't stand it because this is like a highly coveted job. I'm gonna be yes, a sales yes. rep for Procter & Gamble. I'm 21 years old, I'm so excited. So the boss's wife says, so you're a senior. What are you going to be doing when you graduate? And I said, I'm going into sales. And she looks at me and she goes, oh, I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> at the time, I thought it was like, like, you're, like you're a former Green Beret. I, I literally thought it was like that. Like, oh, my God, I don't think I could do that. Like, like jump out of a plane, you know, do brain surgery. I thought it was like that. It was a solid two years later before I realized that is not what she meant. It was not a compliment. Right. And right. so for me, I didn't understand that. Why anyone wouldn't be excited about sales. And what I came to realize over the course of my career is sales is one of the few professions where we let it be defined by the people who do it badly. Yeah. Because in our research that pushy, aggressive, you know, don't care about anything but themselves salesperson is not a high performer. Our research showed that the top salespeople have what we call this sense of noble purpose, that they mm -hmm. truly want to make a difference in the lives of their customers. And that's why they close more deals, they close bigger deals, and they have more loyal customers. And so the yeah. data doesn't lie. This image that we have of sales is actually just of the poor performers. The really good performers have a totally different ethos. Yeah, I saw some research once um, and, and it was presented to an audience of salespeople and they asked everybody in the audience, um, you know, how many of you um, like what you do? Everybody raise their hand. How many of you think you make good money? Everybody raise their hand. How many of you want your kids to go into sales? Nobody raised their hand. And then they presented the data and said, you know, sales is the greatest return on money spent on education. Um, happiest, most fulfilled people, lowest suicide rates, lowest depression. I mean, all these things. And they're like, well, why don't you want your kids to go into right. sales? And they said, because of the reputation. Because you of know, the reputation. Yeah. I grew up, um, you know, my dad was a car salesman and I grew up mm -hmm. as a lot boy. So I saw, you know, the typical, you know, the sales guys with plaid coats on and, you know, selling people left and right. If you're on the lot, you were there to be sold. And when I got into sales in pharma, I thought, oh God, that's not what, 
I want to be on. I'm here to help, you know, doctors and educate them and, and all that. But um, it took me a while to really figure out what the profession was all about. Well, and what's happening now, we're doing work all over the world, you know, post COVID because a couple of crucial shifts have taken place. One, mm -hmm. salespeople all have to sell virtually because it does not matter um, where you are. You know, companies have not opened up to the point where they're letting outsiders come in. So all sellers have to sell virtually. So that's one thing that's happening. And, the, and because of that virtual selling, we're in a spot now where the usual handshake, get you a cup of coffee, sit down, all that's gone. It's all about, you know, can you really help me? And so the second shift that's happening across America and largely the world is customers are asking a fundamental question. Are you here to help me or are you just trying to close me? And what we're seeing is brand reputations are being won and lost based on perceived intent. The other thing that we're seeing, we're getting a lot of calls from chief revenue officers and CEOs because the other thing that's happening is individuals around the world are starting to question, who am I? What am I doing? Why am I here? What's my larger purpose? And is it aligned with this company? Because I often liken what happened in COVID to if you've ever been through, I'm of the age where it's common to ask people, are your parents still living? And mine are not. If you've ever been through the death of a parent, something traumatic like that gives you pause and you go, why am I here? You know, maybe it was a divorce, a bankruptcy, but these health scare, these kinds of things give us pause. And so what happened now though, is everyone had it at the same time. So yeah. you have customers asking, who am I, you know, who are you and why are you here? Are mm -hmm. you here to help me or close me? And then you have employees, salespeople all over the world saying, why am I here? Am I actually doing anything? And so that confluence of events has really given birth to a renewed sense of energy around this idea of selling with noble purpose. No. It's gone from kind of a nice to have to an, something that's urgent. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what compelled you, you know, what, what you're seeing, what I'm seeing is with a lot of clients, they're sellers and doers. And a lot of the leaders will say, everybody wants to do, nobody wants to sell. Yeah. Or, you know, they get something through the pipeline, they get it at the bottom and they're focused on getting that deal done. And they're not at the top of the funnel, basically developing new relationships and reaching out and and, and being curious about challenges that people mm -hmm. are facing. I, I think that's the, the thing that is really different is they're not, instead of being curious about challenges customers are having, they're thinking, how do I go out and sell? Why do they want to talk to me and, and get sold to yeah. I mean, what, what are you seeing? Well, it's interesting because if if you are thinking that as a seller, oh God, these people are busy. I don't want to sell to them. You're probably not going to be that successful, even if you do marshal up the internal resources to go do it. But what we've seen with a number of our clients, when you have a clear sight line to what we call your noble purpose, which is right. simply put how you make a difference to clients. When you have a clear sight line to that, the urgency increases quite dramatically. And what I will say in defense of salespeople, and I will go to the map forever for salespeople, um, a lot of them feeling like, gosh, I have to go out and push something on somebody is coming from above. Because there's two ways a leader can talk about the business. They can say, you know, if you were my salesperson, I could say, Jan, you got to hit these numbers. When are you going to hit the number? When are you going to close it? How much is it going to be? And that's going to put you in a very transactional mindset. Or I can have a different conversation and I can say, yeah, we hit our numbers. But the way we do that is by making a difference to customers. Mm -hmm. How are you going to improve life for your customers? How is the customer going to be different as a result of doing business with us? And if I start having that conversation with a seller, then their ethos is totally different. And, and I think that's one of the problems that, that we, we see is that the internal conversation becomes the external conversation. And if the internal conversation is not about making a difference to customers or helping them, if it's just about numbers, you're going to create a transactional sales force. Yeah, that's in the book you talk about that key leader question is, how will this customer be different as a result of doing business with us? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what you talk a lot about is the a drive or a motivator being to improve the customer's life. Mm -hmm. um, two questions. How do we screen for that in potential employees? 
-hmm. and how do we develop that in people? You know, that, how yeah. do we develop that driver? And can we, or do we, or can we only hire for it? Uh, you can develop it. The last 10 years of my life have been spent doing this. <laughs> so I can tell you right now, you can develop it. It's easier to hire for it, but um, you you actually need to do both at the same time. So um, let's go to the the first one, the hiring for it, and then I'll tell you how to develop. So there are two ways that you hire for someone driven by a sense of noble purpose. First, you got to name it and claim it in your organization. You've got to name and claim your noble purpose, and you need stories out there about how you're making a difference to customers. And I want to be really clear on this. Your noble sales purpose is not just, we want to be good citizens and we give all this money to charity and all that. that that's all great. And I encourage that. But it is a clearly articulated story about how you make a difference to your customers, how you're putting a dent in the universe, whether you're selling pharmaceuticals that are healing people. We, I just was on a call earlier this morning with a communication company, and they're talking about how they're connecting people better, enabling them to communicate better. So you, the first way you hire for it is make it part of your brand. So people will be attracted to you. That's what the right people want. The second way is there's a simple question that you can ask in an interview. Mm. And it's this, tell me about a time when you made a difference to someone at work. Mm. And you watch with that, how that person answers. Now, a lot of people will be schooled to say, well, I, I got these numbers for my company and I did this. That's because they think that's what you want to hear. You lean in and you say, mm. we're a noble purpose company. We want to hit our numbers, but we're also really interested in people who want to mm. make a difference. Can you tell me about a time when you did that? And you watch the right person tells you about that, their whole face lights up. Yeah. And they'll start saying things. One of our clients was when they started asking this question was like, people start saying things like, gosh, I don't think or talk about that that much. I'm so glad you asked. You know, it comes to light. So that's yeah. the first. Yeah, good. I just thought of an example. I, I'm, I'm working with someone who's who coaches elite athletes. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the, the threads of discussion we've had lately is, yes, he helps people become extraordinarily good athletes. But mm -hmm. what he really does is he helps these athletes figure out who they really are. That's what he does. They, these athletes go on a hero's journey, you know, and, and sometimes it's a very selfish pursuit, you know, to become an extraordinary athlete. In the end, they all get to the same place. And that is um, for whose good do I serve? Yeah. How do I help people? I mean, they figure out who they really are. And, and it's interesting that, you know, you wouldn't think someone that's training people, you know, would think so deeply about their noble purpose, what they're really working on. And I think we, you know, we all are served well when we spend that time thinking about the difference yeah. we make. And I think that's what you're advocating for. It absolutely is. And, and so I want to translate it now to a, to a business setting. Yeah. So yeah. you're looking for people who have this innate sense. What I will tell you is it is innate in a given sales organization. We see it in the top performers, that top 10 or 15% of performers. But it is teachable in everything else, in everybody else, almost everybody else. So I will also tell you, human beings are complex. We have multiple motivations. There's nothing wrong with wanting to make money for your family, for yourself. So I don't want to, you know, make these, you know, two opposite things that can't be pursued simultaneously. But the way you start to teach it in an organization, and we've been really successful in a number of organizations of moving both the strategic north and the emotional epicenter of the business up mm -hmm. towards this idea of customer impact. And so there's three things you can do just as a result of this, listening to this, you know, LinkedIn Live, there's three things you can do. One, when you're a leader, start telling stories about how you made a difference to customers. We tend to tell the story about how we closed the big deal, and that's great. We tell stories about use cases. Those are helpful because then we understand but there's a third kind of story we call them customer impact stories. And there's a model for telling them inside selling with noble purpose. So first and foremost, as a leader, start telling stories about how you improve life for customers. Mm. That's how you create the organizational narrative. The second thing is make customer impact as clear and present as your sales targets. And the way that you do that is you say, we closed 30 sales this week. Let me tell you about one of those customers and how it made yeah. a difference. So on your leadership airtime, which is your most precious asset as a leader, make sure you're spending about half of it on customers 
and half of it on the the numbers, which, which if you yeah. pay attention to your leadership airtime, most of us are about 90% on the numbers. So oh, tell yeah. us tech stories everywhere, evaluate your leadership airtime and get at least half of it spent on customers. And then the third thing that you can do, and this is really crucial, is in the cadence of regular sales, ask the question you alluded to before. How will this customer be different as a result of doing business with us? We're doing a pipeline review. I'm saying, Jan, when are you going to close it? How much is it going to be? All I have to do is add one question. How will this customer be different as a result of doing business with us? Yeah. If you do those three things, you can shift the, like I said, the strategic center and the emotional epicenter of your organization in the direction of customers. Yeah. Uh, I, I've sat in a couple of sales meetings recently to, you know, leaders have asked me to listen in and provide feedback. And there's hardly any storytelling about, about the clients. Um, and it's funny, we interviewed Margaret Heffernan recently, and she talked a lot about, um, you know, the conundrum of efficiency and so many of the things that are really important can't be measured. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think that's what you're saying. Um, mm -hmm. Speaking of things that can be measured, you know, what's the, you know, there's a lot of research that went in, into this. What, what's the, what's the data show? What are some of the, the, the things you would highlight for those that are, you know, want to know, Hey, give me the proof. You know, yeah, so, so if this seems gauzy, let me tell you the proof and then I'll tell you why. Organizations with a purpose bigger than money outperform the market by over 350%. There's been a lot of data on this. Organizations who make improving customers' lives, the center of everything they do, outperform the market by these huge numbers. The latest study from a gentleman named Jim Stingle, former CMO of Procter & Gamble, worked there about the same time I did, outperformed by 350%. The wow. second thing you need to know is there was an amazing study by Dr. Valerie Good at Michigan State University. She had read the original version of Selling with Noble Purpose, and she saw the research that showed that sellers with a noble purpose are in the top 10%, and she wanted to test it on something else. Mm -hmm. So she did a research study. This is her PhD. Wow. She did a study where she looked at Sellers with, with this sense of wanting to make a difference in the customer's lives, this sense of purpose versus sellers who were good people, who were just saying, I just want to do a good job, hit my numbers. And what she found is those noble purpose sellers had more resilience and they put forth more effort over time. Hmm. And the reason that this happens is because we human beings are never better than we're when we are involved in a cause bigger than ourselves. Hmm. We have two fundamental human being, human needs, belonging and significance. We need part of something bigger than ourselves and we want our part to matter. So when you're a noble purpose seller, you're dialed into something bigger than yourself. You're there to make a difference to customers. Yeah. So if you lose a deal or things go south or a global pandemic hits and you have to go home and make Zoom calls at your kitchen table, you know my people still need what I have. My customers are counting on me. I got to get out there. And so it, it, it changes your approach to your job. And then the, the other piece of data that I will tell you is that all the research shows that when you have a purpose at work and you don't have to be curing cancer. I mean, if you are, God love you. But if you're just like our company, we just spoke with helping people communicate better. Uh, we have a bank. They say their purpose is to fuel prosperity. When you have a sense of purpose at work, it radiates out onto everything else in your life. Mm -hmm. You become happier, you become more grounded, you become centered because then you know, I'm not just a cog in a machine. I may be a little part in a bigger machine, but it's, I'm a part that matters and the machine actually matters. Mm -hmm. If I'm a part that doesn't matter and the machine doesn't matter, that is a recipe for a disengaged life. I, I wanted to ask you, I'm glad you brought up the belonging part. Um, you know, you, you talked about two things, um, significance and belonging. You know, with a lot of really great salespeople, they work pretty darn independently. Yeah. I mean, is belonging something really important to them, do you think? Or is it, I mean. It actually yeah. is because, is and belonging doesn't mean that we do everything together. To be honest, it doesn't even mean I'm a great collaborator. Hmm. 
what belonging means is I am part of something bigger than myself. And you get a sense of belonging from your family. You get a sense of belonging from your country for many people, which explains a lot of the issues we have, because if I don't like the way it's going, it's a problem. But this sense of belonging, you know, you are ex-military, and I'll tell you that one of the things that we studied when we were doing the new edition of Selling with Noble Purpose is, and, you know, I don't know why we did this, but we wanted to study people under adverse conditions because the book came out. We were putting it to bed as COVID was hitting, little did we know that that one section on adverse conditions was going to prove to be more important than we realized. But we looked at folks in the military. And I would be curious as to your perspective on this. Some of the answers we got about when we asked them, how did you survive difficult conditions? And it was a sense of commitment to the mission and to the team. Those two things. I'm part of something bigger than myself. And, and my team, that's the only yeah. way I got through it. Yeah, I, in my experience, I, I can only speak for mine, difficult times in, in the, um, was one, you didn't want to let anyone down. Right. And two, you know, you always reminded yourself it could be worse. <laughs> so <laughs> if it was cold, you'd say, well, at least it's not raining. If it started raining, you'd go, well, at least we only have seven more days, not a month left. You know, I mean, you know, some of the guys would say, well, at least, at least we're not in combat and nobody's shooting at us. I mean, right. There was always a way to think about how it could be way worse. And that right. was our sick sense of humor way that we dealt with things. Right. And honestly, it's how I dealt with this past year. You know, right. I, you, I won't even go where my mind, tell you where my mind's been of how this last year could have been way worse. Don't, I, mean, don't, I don't want to know. Yeah, I won't go there. Um, <laughs> but. You know, I, I no, this is really interesting. And, you know, I, I'd love for you to comment on the leaders that are, are struggling leading teams where they've got people that are almost paralyzed. You know, yeah. it's like, because what I hear everybody say is, well, I'm best face to face, you know, having mm -hmm. coffee and lunches and golfing. And, you know, I can't, I can't do this two dimensional thing. I mean, what, what do you say to, what do you say to that? And to the leaders trying to coach people not not to the not to the salespeople, but to the leaders leading teams will say all that. Yeah. So just as you said, I'm best face to face, which is something that I relate to. I also thought I bet there was a crop of people going, you know, I'm much better on a horse than I am in this car thing. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> ask yeah. how that worked out. So the thing for leaders is back to what we talked about for motivation. Um, there's a very famous quote. I wish I could remember who said it. How do you motivate people? And the answer is you don't. You create the conditions whereby motivated people could step into it. Mm -hmm. So knowing, though, that people are having trouble. So the first thing that you want to do as a leader, if you have people that are having trouble, is start with the storytelling about how you make a difference to customers. Mm -hmm. Because what you've got is, again, no one's shooting at us, but you do have some amygdala fight or flight response going on here. Uh, if I'm saying, I can't do it, I can't do it. That's, you know, that's your amygdala talking. That's not you on your best day. That's not your best self. And if that's where your people are, that's where they are. But what you've got to do is first off, you've got to get the rest of their brain work. And I'm going like this because you want to ignite their frontal lobes. Mm -hmm. And the way you do that is you say, okay, Jan, I know it's hard, but you know what? Say it in your Zoom call, say it in a one-on-one. -on -one. one of the things that I always remember is that sale we made six months ago and how that made a difference to that client. And mm -hmm. I check back with them and their data is faster or their accounting's working now or their whatever it is and say, whenever I think about what we do, I think about it that way. So that's the mm -hmm. first thing that you wanna do as a leader. And then that enables you to pivot the conversation and say, we might be better face to face. There's a lot of people that are having to parent their children from another part of the world or deal with their parents. And they might be better face to face too, but they're still doing it. So given the constraints that we have, how can we still make a difference to customers? And, and I want to be clear. I'm going to draw this on a piece of paper. It's like if you've got a plane sitting on a runway, there's my little piece of paper there that you can yeah. see. Yeah. If you shift that beginning just 10 degrees, 
you go to a totally different destination. If we start from, Jan, I need you out there. You got to hit these numbers. You got to hit these numbers. Then I'm back at myself. But if I say, our customers need us, we make a difference. How can we do it in this environment? I'm shifting you, it seems like 10 degrees, but you're going to end up at a totally different place. You won't do it beating somebody around the head telling them, you've got to make these numbers. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah. So it's, it's the little things that make the big difference. Yeah. Um, and I want to be clear, the numbers do matter, but they are a lagging indicator. You have to deal with the leading indicator, which are the words and beliefs of your team and the behavior of your team. That's yeah. what you can coach to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean the takeaway I'm getting, um, you know, again, a great reminder of how important the stories are. Um, it, it, you know, part of the way that you um, position different items in the book is philosophy versus system. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it, you know, so a lot of what you, what I've heard you describe so far has been philosophy. Is there a part that's a system for those people that want the structure? There is absolutely a structure. So we spent the last 10 years doing this with companies. And um, I am all about the aspiration and the strategic intent. I also have a 27 point punch list because <laughs> just to talk about that. And there is um, a real model for doing this. There are some of the things that are in Selling with Noble Purpose, the book around how to have a pipeline conversation, how uh, a formula for telling these stories, where to tell these stories, how, what to talk about at your meetings, how to do a lost sale review. And so one of the things that we wanted to do with Selling with Noble Purpose, I say we, my co-author on the second edition was Elizabeth Letardo, who has a background in industrial psychology. And one of the things that we wanted to do was provide things that were actionable that you could insert into the cadence of regular business. So you'll see in there, um, one example, there's like a before and after on how you run a sales meeting, where you're still talking about the same things, but you're just shifting them and you're, you're talking about them differently and you're using different examples. So there is a real methodology to this. And one of the things that we've seen is when companies start to implement this, people ask me how long it takes. And my answer is usually one day and a year. Because <laughs> the first day you start doing it, you get a positive emotional response. And what we see is within about a year, the sales results are exponentially higher. I mean, we've had some people double revenue, become the market leaders, take on bigger players, things like that. But there is a, there is a system to it. And it's all outlined in Selling with Noble Purpose. Oh, good. Um, and, and a reminder to those listening, if you've got any questions, um, comments, let us know. Um, so what might be the obstacles, um, particularly internal obstacles to implementing this? Somebody's listening and they say, this is awesome. My organization needs to do this. Right. What, what, what are they up against? Because this is this represents change, right? It does. And what I would say is the biggest obstacle is understanding of other people. Because whenever I speak, I'll speak to a big group and I'll have people come up to me afterwards and say, this selling with noble purpose, this is what I believe. But, and here's what I get with the but. My boss, she's all about the numbers. Our CEO, he only cares about the shareholders. And what's interesting is this happens at places where the boss actually hired me to come speak. So that's clearly not completely true. But the biggest obstacle is in the cadence of business, we don't give voice to this kind of thing. Most everybody you work with has been trained in a different lexicon at a CEO of a bank. And he said, lumber numbers are my love language. He said, it's my lingua franca. It's what I've been taught to speak in. But I care very deeply about our customers. But that's not what I talk about on a regular basis. And so to me, the biggest obstacle is someone having permission to start. And don't assume that other people don't believe this. Yeah. because we don't know what's in people's hearts. The second obstacle that we face is the same obstacle that we face in trying to be a good parent, in trying to be a good partner, trying to be a good friend. 
is daily life gets in the way of our best intentions. Yeah. I had a friend, she went on this week long spiritual retreat and she said, Oh, you know, you come, you want to come from that place of love and gratitude and open heartedness. And I'm at this spiritual retreat and it's all happening for me. And then I come back home and somebody's got to make the damn dinner. And <laughs> so the challenge that we face is twofold. One, we got to give voice to it. And there's a method in the book for giving voice to it. And don't assume that other people don't want this just as much as you. The second challenge is the cadence of daily organizational life will be about the numbers. Yeah. And so you, it only takes a minute, like literally a 60 second minute to add a story, to give emotion and meaning and context to those numbers. And then the third thing is people will create a false dichotomy. And they'll say, well, is it about the noble purpose and improving life for customers or is it about making money? And the data tells a very different story. The data tells us that the profit and the purpose are connected and that when you point the North Star towards purpose, it doesn't mean give away the store. It doesn't mean do a lot of stuff for free. It means laser focus on customer impact. When you do that, if you've got the right system in place, you will make more money. Yep. That's awesome. And um you talk about the mental abilities of top performers that uh -huh. I thought this was interesting that one, you know, going back to adversity, um, that they can deal with uncertainty. Uh -huh. And then the other thing I was curious about is you say they can hold two agendas at once. Yeah. So I'm, I, I'm guessing what those are, but I, I'd love to hear you <laughs> kind of explain that. Um, and then I have so one more question before we go. Okay, there's a very famous quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald, and I, I might butcher it a little bit, but he said, uh, the ability to hold two seemingly conflicting ideas in the mind at the same time is a sign of keen intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so what we saw with top performers were they could hold on to the idea, this is about making a difference to the customer and improving the customer. And I do have an agenda here and I have to hit my number. And they could hold those two ideas simultaneously, much like I want to love and connect with my children and I got to get the damn dinner on the table. Like I ought to be able to hold those two ideas. And, and it's actually connected to the ability to sit with uncertainty because one of the things we found, we tend to think of those salespeople that are like, it's all about me. Yeah, I've got this. I've got this. You want to buy this? Here are some watches. We tend to think of them as very self-oriented. And they may be, but we often attribute more negative intent to that than needs to be. Because in reality, often what they are is insecure and they don't have the confidence to just let an agenda play out. They want to get their part in because they're worried they're new. I mean, I was like that when I was new. Hell, I'm still like that sometimes. But this ability to say, I can hold both these agendas and I'm comfortable with some uncertainty. I'm confident I can help this person. I don't know exactly how yet, but my confidence that I can gives me the ability to sit with some uncertainty and have a strategic conversation and let that play out. And so those two things were really coupled in top performers. And what we found, it was often the result of just who they were, oftentimes coupled with a lot of experience. And what we found was you can teach this to just about anyone, but you got to call it out as a skill. You can't just expect them to, you know, suddenly, suddenly I'm okay with uncertainty and I can just listen to the customer without worrying about my part. You got to call it out as a skill and say, in this call, there's going to be five full minutes where I want you to be uncomfortable. I want you to be comfortable with uncertainty and I'm going to time you. Okay, you did it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And my last question um, is the second most important person. Yeah. Who's, okay. who, who's the second most important person? So this is based on something that my dad told me that had just a forever impact on me. When I was, I, you know, I mentioned my first job was for Procter & Gamble and I was a sales rep and I desperately wanted to be a sales manager. For the moment I started, I wanted to get promoted. And um, they had a management fast track and, and I was on it. But, you, you know, you had to clear certain gates. And at that time, the managers in that company, I'm getting to the second most important person, the managers in that company carried these briefcases. When you got promoted to manager, you got this briefcase. And it was an all leather briefcase. I weighed about 110 pounds. I could, be, I, I didn't, could barely carry the thing, but I, but I wanted one. 
It was an <laughs> all leather briefcase with your initials embossed in gold. We're talking very Mad Men, very old school. It wasn't that long ago, but it was still like that. And you could see the managers walking through the hall because they had the signature briefcase. I wanted one so desperately. So I had gotten passed over a couple of times for promotion. I've been up, had gotten it once, been up, hadn't gotten it second time. Third time, if you don't get it, you're not getting it. So, you know, I talked to my dad a lot about it. So the third time I finally get this promotion and I'm a sales manager and I'm so excited. I can't stand it. I finally got promoted. I got the briefcase. I'm a manager. I'm the bottle rug of middle management. I'm so excited. <laughs> so I call up my dad and I say, I got it. I just try, I got it. And he said, well, congratulations. You just became the second most important person in the life of your team. And I'm like, what are you talking about? All I think about was I become a manager. I didn't even think about those people. And he said, yeah. He said, you're their boss now. And he said, next to your spouse, your boss has the potential to make your life wonderful or make your life miserable. And when he said it, I was like, oh, shit. Because I remember my dad talking about his boss. I remember talking about Mr. Keck at dinner all the time. My mom was a school teacher. I remember her talking about her principal. I know all about Lilith's divorce, you know? And I just, and I thought about my bosses and I went, oh my God, that is me now. I'm the second most important person in their lives. Holy crap. I was scared out of my mind. I felt sick. I thought, I'm going to get the briefcase back. <laughs> but, but I did not. And while I was not always a perfect boss, knowing that my words were in the hearts and minds of my employees and that I had the opportunity to make their life wonderful or make their life miserable, it, it really was quite sobering. And it was really a call to be a little better than I had been. And, and as it relates to this topic of purpose, the top performers have an innate sense of purpose and they will find it. And if it doesn't exist at your company, they will leave. But where the real opportunity is, is in the majority of people who desperately want a sense of purpose and who, who have a little bit of it in them, but their frontline managers have such power to lift that up and keep it present in the cadence of daily work. And it means everything to people. I, I really appreciate that story. Um, that's awesome. Lisa, how can um, people learn more about you, your work, all the things you do? Because I'm thinking if I'm a leader out there, I'm like, how do I book Lisa and get her to get things going here? Um, you know, and they, that you're the hack. You're the shortcut. Um, I, that's what we try to be. The shortcut to uh, more emotional engagement, more customer engagement, and more revenue. Uh, you can Google selling with noble purpose and you'll find my website or you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn and um, I'm easy to find there. Yeah. And, 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 and there's the book. And again, second edition and, and um, so happy that you came on today. I um, can't wait to send this recording to all my clients and, and, and share it widely. It was wonderful. I, I, I love your passion and energy. It was such a pleasure to be with you. Likewise. All right. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks.